this is John Wigglesworth at the Bali PIM at Sheffield Hallam University, and I'm talking to Dustin Hosseini, and you're going to tell us what you were talking about in your presentation. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, well, my talk was called From Print to Digital, From Static to Dynamic. Enabling EAP tutors with the knowledge and training to integrate collaborative, interactive activities online. Um, the aims of the talk were to kind of highlight a gap in the Bali teaching competencies, because they do talk about knowledge that teachers should have in three bullet points. Uh, so knowledge and understanding of electronic media and modes knowledge and understanding of the new technologies that can support this and also the ability to implement uh, IT into the delivery of teaching. However, they don't really address specific ICT and digital literacy competencies that EAP teachers require in order to integrate technology into teaching practice and the learning and teaching process. Uh, so that's the kind of issue or problem I was looking at um, because I believe and according to the research, lecturers, tutors, etc., need appropriate knowledge and training in order to actually take full advantage of, for example, Moodle, Mahara, mm -hmm. Blackboard, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Otherwise, if they don't have this knowledge and training, they won't take advantage of it. And it might become just a repository, so a list of documents. So you're talking about more than just the technical knowledge of how to set up a, a, yes. a Moodle thing? More or less, yes. Um, and I base it upon a few, a few theories, I guess. One of them is social constructionism, so Vygotskyan approaches to learning, which is learning as a social process. The other one, to a little bit, uh, to a smaller extent, is uh, constructivism. So Kenji, I really haven't read much of his work, but from what I understand, he advocates active discovery. So you know, learning by doing and also supporting collaboration and individual activities, just like Vygotsky. Then there's the open source movement. Uh, that's one advocate is Eric Raymond. He actually wrote a book, which is an e-book, which has been around since 97, called The Cathedral and Bazaar. And uh, Bazaar. Basically, the analogy is the cathedral is, for example, an EAP textbook. Mm -hmm. It's published, it's perfect, supposedly. Or, for example, Microsoft Office. It's published. They don't release it until it's published and it's perfect. And of course you have to pay a handsome sum for it. But the bazaar is something that is, there's a variety to choose from. And it's all there for teachers, learners to kind of take advantage of. I would argue that part of this is uh, EEP course materials that are authored in-house. Mm -hmm. Not simply copied and pasted from a book, but a teacher actually sitting down writing an activity that synthesizes other sources in an original way, uh, or Moodle, or Google Docs, Google Drive. Again, it's more open, it's less restricted, or even open office. But again, staff aren't usually trained up on these technologies. Uh, or in the example of Moodle, well, it is, for example, a uh, technology representative of the bazaar. Universities try and make it into a cathedral. So it's wonderful, it's perfect, but it's not. It ends up breaking it because it's meant to be free and open as opposed to highly ordered and structured, top-down, in other words. So how, how do universities work to, to constrain something like Moodle? Well, uh, for example, they might externally host it. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the host, which is happening across higher education in the UK, you know, there's lots of external partners, mm -hmm. the... Uh, neoliberalism approach, mm -hmm. uh, what happens is a host might say, okay, here's your Moodle package, there you go, thank you very much for that money, but then we might come back to the university and say, okay, can we have this, this, and this, these plugins, okay, these additional bits, and they'll say, okay, that's a thousand pounds a pop. So then this, it's broken, because now we can't use these potentially great tools because we have to pay more money for them, which in the first place are supposed to be free. Mm -hmm. So they're restricting access. Yes, yes. Now, how does it translate practically for teachers? Well, first of all, they do need training. And I would suggest, just based upon an informal survey of 20 teachers out of 40, you need at least two plus hours per tool. And 
probably the best way, one of them is to sit them down in a lab and lead them through certain things, but also having them play mm -hmm. and having follow-up sessions and also having pre-course um, sessions at least once. But according to what I found out, they also would like bike play sessions, you know, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because pre-sessional courses and foundation courses are very busy, dynamic places. There's so much going on, teachers have to do a lot. Um, okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, as far as potential solutions, in my talk I gave teachers a, a kind of choice because some of the potential solutions that I suggested were um, they fall under two kind of realms, and it's a Venn diagram, if you will, like open and extended learning. And as far as that, it's social media and networking for learning and teaching, and also virtual peer-assisted learning. Uh, within the Venn diagram, the other part of it is uh, tutor-guided learning. Mm -hmm. That would be like empowering students with Turnitin, because you do need that tutor input. In the middle, so between both of them, is collaborative tools, flipped classroom resources, uh, Synchronous or asynchronous quiz tools, such as the quiz tool in Moodle or, for example, uh, Socrative. Uh, engaging for discussions in ePortfolios. We touched on some of these. Um, we discussed, as far as collaborative tools, Google Docs, Google Drive. You can have a classroom, you know, divided into groups, so a classroom of 16 divided into groups of four. They all work in one document towards a common goal whatever that may be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, writing up parts of an essay, defining the vocabulary, exploiting it, whatever you wish, um, taking notes, it, it just depends on the teacher. Flip classroom approaches, um, screencasting, so creating a video, or instead of reinventing the wheel, going on YouTube, looking for videos, which might illustrate concisely, succinctly, for example, paraphrasing, summarization, quoting, or, um, how do you start it in? Setting it for homework, then you come into the classroom and you have that extra time to do more work, to do more interactive, engaging things. Because if you do a lesson on paraphrasing in the classroom, it's very difficult. It can be. You can spend a lot of time or waste a lot of time trying to explain and get that across. Uh, E-portfolios were something else. Uh, this is kind of a new area, especially with EAP, in terms of EAP. Um, it involves tracking students' learning by evidencing, by having them evidence their own learning. So, for example, a weekly learning journal, mm. or at Bath they did the reading logs. That could all go into an e-portfolio, which the tutor could then comment upon either verbally or through text directly on his portfolio. Um, also, weekly speaking videos around a, central, uh, a centrally set topic or a classroom set topic which practices their speaking skills, you know, two or three minutes each week per student, not too much. And the final part of that, I might suggest, is uh, having them put their writing up there. So first drafts and redrafts of those drafts so that it evidences a kind of slowly progressing um, progression of learning. So uh, where should uh, a Bali member go if they want to find out more about, about this? Um, well, JISC publishes a lot of information about how to integrate and exploit learning technologies. Um, one of their projects at the moment is called JISC Digital Student. So I'll, someone would just have to go and open a browser and go to Google or whichever their browsers, their search engine of choices, mm -hmm. and type in JISC, Digital Student Project, and it'll come up with a few examples of guidance. Um, where else could they go? In the same line, JISC has published works on uh, digital literacies. They also have something called JISC Info Kits. And again, that can also be Googled. Um, looking at other universities' policies on embedded in digital literacies as well. For example, uh, further reading that I have on my slides is Leeds Met University. Uh, embedding digital literacy as a graduate attribute it's a great PDF, it's clearly written and they give lots of good examples and spell it out very clearly. Open University as well, Digital and Information Literacy Framework. And then also uh, just various resources online. So for example, Vanderbilt University has something on flipping the classroom. It's just a very short guide. But there are so many resources 
you know, maybe a bit overwhelming at times. Okay, Dustin and Staney, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John.